Thank you for coming to the Pi Data Salt Lake City uh, speaker series. Um, I didn't think uh, we would get so many RSVPs. Uh, we have people attending from the UK, uh, Toledo, Ohio, India, uh, various US states. And also I see a couple students from my advanced Python course in here also. So there are a lot of different people uh, here. Um, and we are, I want to go through these slides. Can everyone see my slides? Matt, can you see the slides that I have up right now? They're good. So we're Pi, uh, Pi Data Salt Lake City. I'm gonna give you a slight intro to kind of explain who we are and what we do and why Pandas is actually uniquely connected to Salt Lake City, right? And so we're gonna be talking about Pandas and how is uniquely connected it starts simply with the libraries that are used that make up pandas. So the Python libraries that make up pandas are one, NumPy, the major packages. So it's the fundamental package for scientific computing with Python. And it was created by Travis Oliphant. So hopefully all you guys out here in the audience know who this is, but he is the creator of NumPy. And also he is the organizer of Pi Data as uh, a Salt Lake City. And so he's connected in that fact that his package is actually a core component of Pandas, but we also have Matplotlib. So the connection goes a little bit further because what does all, the, all those packages, the three packages, you have Pandas, you have NumPy, you have Matplotlib. So how are they connected to the story, right? Well, they're all supported by one organization, funded by one organization called Nonfocus. So Nonfocus, what they do is they, they've envisioned this inclusive scientific research community that utilizes open source software to make impactful discoveries for a better world. And that includes the physical sponsorship of Matplotlib, Pandas, NumPy, a lot of different uh, open source packages are being sponsored through NumFocus, and they have this uh, objective or this vision in order to see this these types of uh, packages grow. And so because of their support, we are now able to fly helicopters to Mars because they're using open source software that's supported through NumFocus. So what's the other connection? Well, Pi Data is actually uh, a product of NumFocus and PyData is this community of developers and users of open source data tools. So PyData meetups are happening all around the world. Um, there's global conferences, regional conferences, uh, where you can get together with like-minded people about data. It's not exclusive to Python. It's also R and Julia and any other tools centered around open source data tools. So that's the story and how all of this wraps together from Pandas itself to the creator, to NumFocus, uh, to us and how we fit in this ecosystem. One of the things that I want to focus on now that we have this speaker series going is that I wanted to focus on the values that uh, we want to have our, uh, regarding this speaker series. And I thought it was important to outline those is that uh, we are an inclusive community that will grow while supporting each other throughout our data journey. So we want this to be a great community in which we all can grow and that we value excellence and we provide a place where each of us can continually learn and progress. All right. That's enough about me. And so tonight's uh, talk is from Matt Harrison uh, and we're going to uh, give you a short background about Matt and from, I'm going to tell you from, from my perspective and how I know him and know of his work is I can tell you he's a leader in the data science world and I can speak to that because he's the author of many popular books. I currently teach out of his Pandas 1.x cookbook, right? He's an excellent instructor and trainer. I can actually affirm this statement also because I'm enrolled in his effective book authoring course. 
So, um, and he gives back to the Python community. And I know this firsthand because we both serve on a technical advisory board for an open source Python package called Yellow Brick. Um, he also runs his, his consulting firm, Meta Snake, uh, and he will probably mention this a little bit more. Um, and with that, I want to pass it over to, to Matt and let him uh, begin his talk. So uh, let me stop sharing. And Yep, I can hear you. Awesome. Okay, should we take two? Yeah, take two. Action. Okay. Here we go. Let's see if it cross my fingers this time. Um, okay. Yay. I think, I think we're working now. Okay. Awesome. So apologize for that. Um, kind of odd. I was on a zoom earlier today. I was on two different other uh, video conferences today. So sometimes I guess my computer just gets overworked. Okay. So hi everyone. I'm Matt Harrison. I'm excited to be here. So as Larry said, um, I am the author of a couple books. And so why might uh, you be interested in hearing from me? Um, so a long time ago, I wrote this book right here, um, Learning the Pandas Library, which I think is five years old now. Um, I, I'm actually in the middle of rewriting this book. So in the meantime, after I wrote that book, um, I co-wrote the second edition of the Pandas Cookbook. And uh, I have also, uh, I also wrote this uh, Pandas pocket or machine learning pocket reference. And I've taught probably thousands of people Pandas in the meantime and consulted on it and seen a bunch of Pandas code uh, over my time. So uh, I've come to have some pretty strong opinions about uh, what is good and maybe less good with Pandas. Um, so that, that is the impetus of this talk is um, some best practices that I've seen after uh, using Pandas for quite a while and being involved in other people learning it, leveraging it, and using it. So um, on that note, uh, my company, Metasnake, is going to be doing a Pandas workshop later uh, this summer. So if you find that you like this talk and you're interested in like taking these ideas that I'm talking about and applying them to your data in a hands-on environment with other students. Um, follow me up on Twitter or LinkedIn because I'm going to be running a workshop for students to uh, practice these on their own data. Okay, and uh, on Twitter, I'm Dunder M. Harrison, underscore, underscore M. Harrison. Okay, so what are we going to talk about? Um, we're going to talk about a couple things here. Uh, I'm going to load some data and then we're going to talk about uh, like five things that I think are good practices for pandas that uh, some people know about, some people might not know about. So I'm gonna look at types, how to choose types, um, what chaining means, uh, this idea of mutation, when to do mutation. A lot of people uh, are confused about that. At least that's what I see from looking at students, looking at uh, blogs, looking at how people are telling people how to, how to use pandas. Um, when to use application or apply, and we'll talk about aggregation as well. So um, I don't know if Larry said it, but I'm certainly open to questions. And so if you've got a question along the way, feel free to ask it. Uh, you can, I'll try and monitor the chat if you want to uh, speak it as well. I'm pretty comfortable with that. So uh, hopefully this is more interactive than me just talking, but I'm happy to just talk as well. Okay, um, with that, I'll get going here. So um, I'm gonna load my data. So I'm just gonna do this from Jupyter. So the slides are Jupyter here. So I'm going to be using pandas 1.2.3, but I will say that most of what uh, I'm teaching here uh, applies to pandas versions um, that are, I don't know, three years old now or whatever. So pandas 0 0.24, um, certainly this would apply to. Uh, I'm going to change some options here for display in Jupyter, and I'm going to load my data. So my data that I'm using is from Shul, um, uh, this data set right here, which is, if we look at it, it is from fueleconomy.gov. It's I've got it on my GitHub here, but uh, what it is is the U.S. government for every make and model that's released, they list uh, some data about that, and so this is a data set with that data in there. So maybe. Is this font big enough? Can people see this okay? 
Are we okay with this font? Yeah, it looks good. It looks good? Okay, yeah, we got some thumbs up. Thanks, Matt. Okay, so let me know if it's too, if it's too small, I can blow it up, but uh, I do wanna fit more data on the screen, and not have it be too crowded. Okay, so this is my data. Um, if you look at the summary, summarization here at the bottom here, we got 41,000 rows and 83 columns. So again, th this is like makes and models since I think, I believe 1984, and I believe this goes through 2018 or 2019 is what this data set is. Okay, so here are the columns from this data set. I just read it from a CSV file. Um, there and these there are 83 columns in here. So there are things like uh, number of barrels that you consume, uh, city mileage, which is city 08, um, like CO2 uh, thrown out by the tailpipe, combined mileage, which is combined city and highway, uh, what the drive looks like, the displacement, uh, an engine description, the make model, uh, the year of the car, and a bunch of other stuff as well. So you know, 83 columns, pretty good data set. What I'm going to do is just sh um, let's assume that a client gave me this data set and I'm going to start doing some analysis on it and I'll walk through this. Um, Edward asked, what's the URL for the code? Um, uh, there is no URL for the code right now. If you want a copy of the notebook, hit me up maybe on Twitter or you can hit me up on uh, hit me up at my email here and I can get you a copy of this. Um, the URL for the GitHub, oh, the URL for the GitHub, let me, so if you're trying to follow along at home, you, hopefully you can type fast, but um, uh, let's paste that in here. There's the URL for the GitHub. Okay. Uh, so again, let's, what we're going to assume that like a client gave me this data set, this is, would be like a process that I would go through, or maybe like someone's in, trying to hire me or something. And they're, they're like, here's your take home assignment, right? This would be something similar to what I would do for a take home assignment. So uh, feel free to, you know, if, if you're interested in this, reach out to me and uh, leverage this code, right? I, I think this is fine code, uh, leverage it. I mean, you're going to have to riff on it pretty hard because it's pretty specific to this data set, but uh, still the ideas uh, like uh, Picasso said here. Okay, so we've got 83 columns. I'm just going to look at a subset of them. So I've got city mileage, combined mileage, highway mileage, number of cylinders, displacement of the engine, uh, the drive, the type of drive, the engine description, the fuel cost, uh, the make model, the transmission type, the range, uh, what, what date was created on, and the year. So for, first of all, I'll just say that like I am not a car guru. I don't, I don't consider myself to be a subject matter expert on this data set. So um, generally, you know, when you're working with data, you want to have access to a subject matter expert and uh, especially someone who knows like where the data came from, how it was gathered, why they're missing values, whatnot. And so I'll just say right off, I'm not that person, um, but I'm going to act sort of as that person uh, in this case here. So, you know, if there, if there is something that I'm missing out on or someone has some clue that uh, I'm telling something wrong or erroneous, let me know. Okay, so uh, here's the columns that I'm gonna look at. And I'm just gonna look at the D types here, first of all. And this D types attribute gives me some insight into how pandas loaded this data. So here's the dirty secret of pandas. And another thing, I'm sort of assuming that you know some pandas. So this is not an intro class to pandas. I'm assuming that you know some pandas. If you're expecting an intro class, you're gonna be somewhat disappointed or you might be lost because I'm gonna assume that you know some pandas. But uh, the dirty secret of pandas and the reason why people use it is because Python is a slow language, but pandas makes it so it's not so slow. And it does that as Larry uh, alluded to in the intro by leveraging tools like NumPy. NumPy is a tool that allows you to use pandas, which is, or is to use Python, which is a slow language to manipulate numbers in almost C speeds. And so uh, pandas is basically leveraging NumPy to do some more stuff. So, what I've got here is I've got this table, 40,000 rows, and I've got however many columns here. And pandas is gonna represent each of these columns as a distinct type and basically allocate a block of memory in my RAM for that. So like in 64, the city mileage is stored as an in 64, an eight byte integer. Now, if you're familiar with Python, you will have never seen int64 in Python documentation or when you're looking at types in Python because int64 is not a Python type. 
int is a Python type, right? And float is a Python type, but not in 64. So again, what NumPy is doing and Pandas is leveraging that is, is it saying, let's make 40,000 blocks of eight byte integers. And then if I need to manipulate that, if I need to add it or do math operations on it, using modern computer architecture, SIMD instructions, basically can say like, we wanna add some numbers to that. It can do that basically in the CPU very quickly rather than pulling each of those individual eight byte integers into a Python integer, storing as a Python integer, doing the math operations of the Python integer and putting it back in. So you, you literally gain, you know, five to 10 to 50 X speed increase by leveraging pandas here rather than doing this in pure Python. Okay, so I've got these types here. Generally, when you read a CSV file, you're gonna get generally three types. You might get dates if you tell it to parse dates. I didn't tell it to parse dates. So you'll get integers in 64s. Pandas will give you that if there aren't any missing values. If there are missing values, it will coerce those to floats. Um, so floats support missing values and objects, you might get a num numeric like column that's converted to an object if pandas sees some value in it that it doesn't know how to interpret as a number. So that's, that's a basic gist of these types here. So this gives me some insight into the data. I can see like anything that's an integer, I know that there isn't missing data in there. Floats might be one of three things. It might be all floating point numbers, no missing data. It might be floating point numbers with missing data, or it might be integer like values that had missing values. Uh, object, object is actually not super fast because what object means is that instead of storing like uh, buffers of memory, basically it's pointed to Python objects here. So generally strings are stored as objects, but object can also represent mixed typed data as well. So oftentimes when you read a CSV file, if it's an object column or a string categorical type data, something like that, or freeform text, if a value is missing, it will use a floating point nan, an empty value to represent missing value rather than like an empty string there. So you might get object columns that have both string types and float types in them. Okay, so this should give me sort of a, a plan of attack. I, especially if I'm doing like machine learning, I do want to be aware of if values are missing because most machine learning algorithms will choke if you have missing values. So I might want to do some cleanup of the data. Okay, let's just look at the memory usage of this. If I uh, say memory usage and then say deep is equal to true, it gives me back a panda series in the values of the panda series with number of bytes here for each column. Uh, I do need to say deep because if you're using like objects, then it will tell you how much objects, how much memory the objects are using as well. Um, let's sum those up. And it looks like we're using, I think this is like 19 megs of memory. Okay, so our 40, our 40,000 rows is taking 19 megs by default here. So we're just sort of use that as a benchmark as we go along here and look at different types. So what I'm gonna do first is look at integer types and we'll just pull off. So I'm gonna do some operations here. I'm gonna say pull off the columns I'm looking at and then select the data types, which are integers, and then we're gonna do describe. So I'm chaining these operations together. Now, first of all, I probably wouldn't write this like this. I would probably write this like this way right here. Um, what's the difference between this and this? Well, this one takes a few more lines of code. It also requires that I put parentheses around it. But my claim is that if you write it this way, it's going to be easier to read. You will thank yourself in the future. Your colleagues will thank you because this, uh, one of my operating standard operating procedures when I'm writing code or when I'm training other people to write code is that you want to write, focus on making code that's easy to read. And Pandas is really easy to make code that's hard to read. Um, like if I look at this line up above here, I mean, this starts, you know, especially as it gets longer, it just starts to look like a bunch of characters. However, if I chain it like this, what it looks like to me is a recipe. So I'm going to take the autos data frame. I'm going to pull off these columns. I'm going to select these integer columns from that. And then I'm going to do the describe to get the summary statistics of those. So here are the summary statistics of those. I just like to look at those once I've loaded a data set to sort of get a feel for the data. What this gives you is the count. Uh, that's count has a specific meaning in pandas. It's the number of non-missing values. It gives me the mean, the standard deviation, and then the minimum, maximum, the interquartiles there. So what I can do is just sort of scroll through this data and sort of look how it looks. Like city mileage is going to range between six and 150. Uh, the mean value is 18. The median value is 15 or 17. 
So, okay, that looks okay. We can look over here at like the fuel cost, what that looks like. You can look at the range. The range looks like it's heavily skewed. Most of these are zero and then some are 370. So what range represents is range for electric vehicles. So a lot of them don't have a range because they're not electric. And then year, again, we can see the year goes from, in this case, it looks like 1984 to 2020. Okay, so, um, one thing you might ask yourself is, you know, can I store these types? They're using 8-bit integers with a different type and maybe save some memory. So uh, using NumPy, you can ask NumPy how much memory an 8-bit integer takes. This is an eighth the size of a 64-bit integer, and it will go from negative 128 to 127. So looking at that, you can see that like highway, we could convert highway to an 8-bit integer and not lose any precision unless in the future highway mileage goes up above 127. But for right now, we would be okay with that. However, if we converted city or combined, we would lose some precision on that. Um, let's look at a 16-bit integer, and that goes up to 32,000. So it looks like most of these integer types, we could at least save about a quarter of the size by converting them to eight uh, in 16s. So that's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to say, here is, I'm, I'm going to chain this operation here. Here's my autos. Take out these columns. So th this autos is the data frame with the 83 columns. So I'm going to pull out the columns I'm interested in, and then I'm going to do as type method on this. So the as type method takes a dictionary that maps column names to the types. And then I'm going to uh, say select types now. And in this case, I'm, I have to say these different types because I've changed the types. Uh, if I just say int here, it won't select the int eight types. Not that I have int 16 types, it's not gonna get those while I do, when I do this command, but let's just look at the types here that I pulled out. And it looks like like highway was convert, converted to an eight byte in, or an eight bit integer. And that looks like we haven't lost any data. The other ones look like they're doing pretty good as well. Um, let's, uh, now, one of the things you'll learn in pandas is oftentimes there's like, two or three ways to do something. So if I just wanted to plot everything that's integer-like, I can actually just say select and put the string integer in there. And so here are all the integer-like columns. And it looks like um, we haven't really lost any precision by doing these types here. Let's just look at our memory usage from doing that. And we, we saved like a meg, 1.5 megs from doing that. So uh, you know, not a huge change, but about 10%, a little bit less than 10% of our memory from doing that. Let's look at floats. Okay, so I'm gonna just chain this operation to look at my float types. So these are my float types here, uh, cylinders and displacement, okay? And it looks like here by looking at cylinders, cylinders almost looks integer-esque. You know, let's see that like it's 4.0, 8.0. And if you think about cars, generally they're whole numbers of values for cylinders. So your spidey sense might go off and you might be thinking, why did it represent cylinders as floats? They look whole numbers or integer-like to me. Displacement looks like it's, it's not integer-like. So uh, let's, let's describe cylinders and just look at that a little bit more. And you can see like the minimum value is two, the maximum value is 16. So what happened there? And your hint is, is this count up here. Again, count has a specific meaning in pandas. It means the number of values that we're not missing. Okay, and so um, if we looked at this up above here, we would see that, or we can just look at this entry right above here. There's 41,000 rows, 41,144, but apparently some number of those are missing and hence pandas converted that integer like column into a float because by default, the lowercase int64 type does not support missing values. So again, if I wanted to use this for something like machine learning, I might need to deal with those missing values because most machine learning algorithms really don't like missing values. Um, another way to inspect this is to use value counts. This is another tool that I like to use in, in pandas all the time. And I'm gonna say drop NA as false. By default, when you do a value count, it's gonna give you the frequency of the entries for that column. And, and it's gonna put in the index the, col the, the values from the column and then the counts in the series values over here. So you can see like there are 15,000 four cylinder cars and here we see our, our answer here, 206 of them are missing. So presumably, again, not a subject matter expert, but pres presumably this is like electric vehicles that don't have cylinders, right? I don't, I don't think uh, 
electric engines have cylinders. So you might want to inspect this. So let's use some code to inspect it. I'm going to say uh, from autos, pull off the columns I'm interested in, and let's just query that. I'm going to say cylinders.na. So pandas has a query method that allows you to uh, do some pseudo SQL-esque combined with some Python code in there. So this lets us uh, quickly look up where these values are missing. You can see that my index is now no longer starting at zero. So these are the parts where it's missing. And let's just scroll over a little bit. And we can see like Ultra EV, RAV4 EV, RAV4 Think, Explore Electric. So most of these are looking uh, pretty electric-y. Um, we've got one here, uh, a Subaru RX Turbo from 1985 that doesn't have cylinders. So this one, I, I don't believe that this one is electric. So uh, a subject matter expert might be able to fill us in why this is missing cylinders. Um, I, I presume it should have cylinders from 1985, but most of these are looking electric-y. So um, I'm, I'm just gonna make a executive decision. Again, I'm not a subject matter expert, but I'm gonna pretend that I have a subject matter expert hat on here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, okay, let's take our cylinders. Um, I'm gonna use the assign method here. And what assign does is it allows you to return a new data frame that has new columns in it or that has uh, overridden columns. So we're gonna update cylinders and we're gonna say, take the cylinders column, fill any missing values with N A with zero. Now there shouldn't be any missing values. And because it's now integer-like, convert it to an int eight. And then a similar thing with displacement, some of the displacement is missing. So I'm just gonna do fill N A with zero there. Let's do that and then we'll do a describe here. And now you can see if you scroll over a little bit, um, you can see that cylinders is now not missing any values. So that's looking okay. We do have uh, values of zero cylinders up there as well now. Okay, so uh, we could uh, do this describe here, which is um, a little bit different than what we had above, right? Cylinders uh, was missing values. It had a minimum value of two, but we changed that a little bit. Okay, what else can we do? Um, we can look at these other float things and determine what we want to do with the other floats. We might want to look at the type of a float. So NumPy has this fInfo function that will tell you uh, information about floats. There's iInfo to tell you information about uh, integers. So we can look at this and then we can say, okay, we're, I want to convert uh, displacement uh, to a float 16. Um, and so we'll just do that. And here is our data frame with displacement converted to float 16. This looks okay. It doesn't look like I'm losing it much information, if at all. I might be, you know, maybe need to round that up a little bit, but I should be okay with that. Okay, let's look at our memory usage after doing this. We were at 19.6, now we're at 17.5. So we've, we've, we've saved about two, two megs by doing this. Um, so not huge huge savings, but we're doing okay. Let's, let's now jump into the object columns here and I'll just inspect those here. Here's the object columns. I'm gonna select D types with objects and you can see like drive is one, engine description, make, model, tranny, and created on. So just by looking at these, I can sort of get a feel for what's going on here. It looks like drive is pseudo categorical. What do I mean by categorical? It has low cardinality. What do I mean by cardinality? That's jargon that uh, people use to describe how many unique values there are. So probably not a lot of unique values for drive. Um, that tells me that this might be a candidate for converting to a categoric type. A categoric type is a special type in pandas that can save us a lot of memory. We also have this engine discur, which is the engine description column. And it looks like it's got like parentheticals in here, FFS, it's got missing values here. And then it's got like FFS comma turbo FFS. So this is looking maybe categorical, but maybe a little bit freeform. We've got some like double parentheticals in here. So this is one that we might need to explore a little bit more. It's not clear by looking at this, like there's commas sometimes, sometimes there's this. This looks like it's actually derived from like a freeform text. Um, so uh, freeform text is the bane of most data people. And, and this looks like this is gonna be maybe annoying. Make, probably categorical. Oh, it looks like Matt said uh, this is a Mazda rotary engine for that 1985 one. Okay, I don't know what a rotary engine is, but maybe. Um, so make is probably categorical. I think there's like 100 different makes in here of 40,000. Model, models, pseudo-categorical. I mean, it's going to have a high cardinality, but um, 
you might have like testarossa over five years or something, but sometimes you'll see like, you know, there's 20 different versions of Camrys or something like that. Transmission, transmission looks like it's probably categorical and then created on actually looks like it's a date, right? And by default, when you read a CSV file, it doesn't have type. And so uh, it doesn't know that this is a date. So we might want to convert this to a date. Um, there's a question from Kaylin. Kaylin asks, is it necessary to remember the different conversions like int8, float16, et cetera? Um, it's not necessary, Kaylin. Um, what you'll find is that Pandas requires you to have your data in memory. And so a lot of the time you can save quite a bit of memory by changing the, the default data type. And basically, uh, you know, a lot of my clients are like, how do I fit more data into memory? Well, if you change the types, uh, a lot of times you can save a lot of memory and, and then you can analyze more data, but it, it's not necessary. Um, it, I would say this, Kaylin, I, or sorry, it's not Kaylian, I believe. Um, I would say that you should at least inspect your columns and try to understand them a little bit. And you can see that I'm sort of walking through this process of, of exploring the columns as I'm going. So we call this exploratory data analysis and the, you know, if you're just an analyst or if you're doing machine learning, I highly recommend doing this. I highly recommend doing this manually, um, not like using some tool that just says, oh, calculate all these summary statistics and then just briefly looking over that. Um, why manually? Because you're gonna get a better feel for the data. You're gonna be able to dive into the data. You can try things out, that sort of thing as we're doing this. So uh, to like Matt's point, you know, if, if if this was like a real client, you know, I would be asking that subject matter expert, you know, what's going on with that mouse thing? What, what is that rotary engine and how do we deal with that, right? And so uh, if you just sort of skim over this, you might miss things like that. Okay, so uh, drive, I said drive looks categorical. How do I determine if it's categorical? Uh, that value counts is a super good way to do that. So I do like that value counts, there we go. You can see that there's what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So there's like nine unique values in here. We can see that NAN is one of them. So that's kind of interesting. Like um, what cars don't have a drive? Um, we might want to explore that a little bit as well. Like how do we deal with that? Um, let's look at that for a little bit. So I'm just going to do this query here. Let's look at where the, the, the drive is missing. And we have like an ultra EV, a Think, a Hyper Mini, um, uh, Alfa Romeo, Spider Velocity from 1984. So we have like some, some EVs, some electric vehicles here that are missing values. We have a lot from 1984, like a Corvette that's missing a drive, a Nissan 300 that's missing a drive, a Mercury Grand Marquis wagon. That was a great year for wagons. Um, so it looks like, you know, a lot from maybe 1984 missing drive, um, some from 1999 that look like electric are missing drives. And so this, this might be something that requires a little bit more thought, right? Is this a, a case where uh, when they started collecting this data in 1984, they didn't have drives and entry there. And so um, maybe maybe we need to like explore that a little bit more. And so I mean, I, I don't have this here, but I could do something like this where I say autos um, uh, dot call. We're going to pull off calls here, and then we could do a group by, and uh, we could group by the year, and then we could pull off the drive, and then we could do n unique for the year. Okay, so. Um, there's a number of unique drives for each year. It looks like we do have drives for 1984, right? Um, so uh, maybe it's not the case that all 1984 cars are missing drive, but apparently some of them are. And again, talk to a subject matter expert, see what they say uh, with respect to that. So what I'm gonna do, uh, again, I'm gonna just pretend that I'm a subject matter expert. I'm gonna say, if drive is not there, I'm gonna fill it in with other, and then I'm gonna convert it to a category. Okay, so, uh, and then uh, what, what I'm gonna do as well, as you can see down here in this as type, I'm converting the make to a category as well. So let's do those two changes and now look at the sum of our memory and our memory's now gone down to 12 from 19. So we basically saved almost 30% from converting two of our columns to categorical columns. So you can see that if you go through this step, 
um, Kalyan, that you can save quite a bit of memory. And, and oftentimes this will make a lot of string operations faster if you do this as well. Okay, I'll just cruise through the rest of this here. Um, let's look at transmission. Here's transmission. I, I'm doing my value counts here. Again, drop any is false to see if there are missing values. There's, there's 11 that don't have a transmission, whatever that means. Again, not quite sure. So could be some sloppy data in there. But, but when I look at this column, what, what sort of stands out to me is that it looks like this is a column that's representing two pieces of data. One piece of data is whether it's automatic or manual, and the other one is how many speeds in there. So we've got an automatic four speed, a manual five speed, automatic three speed, an automatic S6. Um, this looks like, I'm assuming this is a six speed. Again, talk to a subject matter expert, but not quite clear. We got variable gear ratios. So that's, who knows what that is. Maybe that's, you know, uh, one of these that has multiple speeds, um, it's automatic. So, you know, you, you have like these Nissans that have whatever infinite speeds or whatever in them. Um, so it looks like there's two pieces of data in this. So what I'm gonna do is again, uh, put on my uh, hat that it, pretend that I am a subject matter expert. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add a new column called automatic. And I'm just gonna look in that transmission column and see if I have the string auto in there. So if auto is in here, I'm gonna say, let's have a what's called an indicator column that is a boolean true or false whether it is automatic and then i'm going to make another column here called speed and i'm going to use uh, this stir extract which allows me to pass in a regular expression i'm going to pull out the digit if there is a digit in here pull it out and uh, if it's missing i'm going to just say fill in a with 20 fill anything that's missing with 20. so we've got some that like don't have a number in here like this um, variable gear ratio so i'm, I'm just going to say that's like it it's 20 speeds okay is that correct probably not but uh, i'm in charge for this data set so i'm going to say that and then i'm going to convert this whole thing to an integer Okay, so let's do this. Um, I'm also gonna drop the transmission column. So I'm gonna say down here, drop the transmission because I've extracted the data that I think is useful for it. I don't want the transmission column anymore. And we're now down at 10 megabytes. So we've added two columns, dropped one, and we went down by another two megabytes by doing that. So we're, we're at about half the, the data by doing that. Okay, the next thing I'm gonna do is work on the dates here. Um, we do have this created on. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try and use the pandas to date time to convert that into a date. And let's run that. I get uh, this red warning here. I'm now at seven megs here. So um, another three megs that I saved by doing that. But I did get this warning here. Um, sometimes you can ignore warnings in pandas, but it might be good to read them. This one says EST identified, but not understood. So basically if, if I look at um, this created on here, pandas, and it turns out it's not pandas, but it's the underlying library that pandas is using to parse this. It doesn't like this EST um, or EDT time zone in there. So I'm gonna go through one more step to just make pandas happy and not worry about that. I'm gonna replace EDT with minus four and EST with minus five using a string operation. And then with that series, I'm gonna throw that into two date time. Let's run that. And you can see when I run that, I don't get the error anymore. So this placates pandas, pandas is now happy. And I'm also pulling off the engine description and looking at the engine description now. So I, I have fixed my date times now. Let's look at engine description. Here are the unique values for engine description. It looks like there's almost 600 of them. A lot of uh, one-offs here at the end that only have one entry in them. This is really suspicious. Again, like I said, this looks almost free form like GMP4 with eight spaces, then some parenthetical here, and then a space, some other parenthetical. So again, this is sort of the bane of most people who are dealing with data. Um, 16,000 of them are missing. Um, a lot of them have this FFS in there. So I'm gonna make an executive decision here that this is sort of free form, but what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna make an indicator column that says, maybe I do care about the FFS being in there. So I'm just gonna indicate whether FFS was in the description column. Otherwise, I'm gonna drop the engine description column as well. So let's do that. Um, we're back at like eight megs after we do that. Okay, so at this point, I, I've roughly gone over most of the columns that I care about. And I, you see that I have not made intermediate variables along the way. I've just chained this operation and built it up as I'm going. So this is, I think, a key point is that 
when you're doing data, generally I recommend working from the raw data. Now it might be slower, it might take more memory or whatnot, but invariably when you do some sort of analysis or machine learning or whatnot, your pointy headed boss is gonna come back to you at some point and say, explain this, what does this mean? And if you're working from some intermediate data set, you change something one day and save it and then load it the next day and start changing it and save it the other day, you're going to run into issues. Here, I don't have any issues because this is my original data set up here and you can read this literally like a recipe. Pull off these columns, set cylinders to this, set displacement to this, set drive to this, set automatic to this, set speeds to this, set created onto this, set FFS to this. Convert these columns to these types, drop these two columns. And then we're doing some memory usage here, but I mean, literally it reads like a recipe. This is what I'm doing to my data as I'm walking through it. So what I like to do is take this chain and convert it into a function. And then what I'll do is I'll take this function and I'll throw it back up in my notebook to the cell right after I load the data. So I have the cell that loads the data, the cell after that is the cell that cleans up the data. Then when I need to start working on this data set again, I don't need to like scroll through 80, 100 columns trying to figure out what order they were executed in. I just run the, two, the cell to load it and the other one to clean it up and I'm good to go. And I can clearly see each step of what's going on there. Okay, um, so I'm just gonna run this tweak uh, one here and just test that it does work. It looks like it does work here. Okay, uh, that's uh, my first section on types. Uh, any questions about that? What questions do you have? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Hey, this is Anir. Uh, I joined a little late, so uh, maybe I have missed it, but what is this autos list call calls you do? Is it, is it a list of columns or is it a keyword that you do when you are chaining? Okay, so I think Amir's question is, what is this doing? Really? Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. So th this is one of the ways in Pandas that we are allowed to pull out columns. So this is not a list operation. This is actually an index operation on autos. And so we're gonna do an index operation and calls, if we look up at the top here, I can scroll back up here. Um, you can see that calls is the list of like um, these uh, columns that I care about. So I'm, I'm doing it an index operation with these columns here. Gotcha, thank you. Yep. Okay, so, uh, and uh, to your point, um, I should actually take this columns here and copy this and paste it into my tweak function because my tweak function, were I to put this up at the top, like I advised saying I, I would do, it would not work because calls would be undefined. So thanks for, thanks for catching that bug, Amir. Okay, uh, Edward says great code, awesome. That's actually what I like that, not because it makes me feel good. Well, it does make me feel good, but because my claim is that if you write pandas code like this, and I will claim that 90% of the people of pandas code I see do not write pandas code like this. If you write pandas code like this, your code will be easy to read. You will be able to come back to your code and understand what you did. And your colleagues will be able to use it as well. And if you use a function like this, you can start reusing it very quickly. So it makes it very easy to keep your notebooks clean and make your analysis go a lot quicker. Okay, other questions? Apologize for drinking on air, but um, I will be, I, in addition to this, I'm teaching eight hours of courses today. So I just got to keep my voice lubricated. Okay, um, let's, let's go on to the next section here, which is chaining. So chaining is also called flow programming. Um, and the point of chaining is that rather than making intermediate variables along the way, which again is what 90% of people who use pandas do, we should leverage the fact that most operations in pandas return a new object. Sometimes they're views, sometimes they're copies of the object, but they return new objects. And that allows us to keep doing these operations on these objects. And so I, I highly recommend that you adopt this style if you haven't, because the chain 
starts looking like a recipe, especially if you put these parentheses around it, it looks like step by step. So I do like putting parentheses around it and putting one operation on a line makes it very clear what we did here. Um, sometimes you might find something that you can't chain. If, if that is the case, there is a pipe method on a data frame. And what a pipe method does is you can pass in a function that takes the data frame, the intermediate state of the data frame. And so you can use that function to just manipulate the data frame and then return the data frame. So I, I recommend if, if there's something that you can't do with chaining leverage pipe to do it, so you have this clean chain of what's going on here. So that this is my chain section, which is actually, um, you know, what I just showed you up here. I'm just going to pop in my calls there again. Let's run that and make sure that this works. And this does work. So there is my chain. Um, Okay, so a comment by Edward about functional programming. And I'm not really going to get into functional programming in here. Um, yeah, I, I did closure for two years. And um, yeah, uh, function, there, there's good and bad things about functional programming. Um, but m I'm more concerned with what I see is when, when I see um, something that looks like this. So th this code here is uh, what I would normally see. And, and Usually it's not in one cell. Normally it's like spread out into 50 cells and they might not be in order. They might be in some arbitrary order. And so this is what I generally see most people do when they start cleaning up with pandas. They'll, they'll make uh, code like this. Now, not only is this hard to read, it's also violating a lot of coding principles. And I get it like a lot of, a lot of people who are using pandas don't care to be software engineers, right? They're like pandas is a tool. I don't want to care about like best practices of coding or whatnot. But for example, this is making global variables all over the place, which is actually wasting more memory than uh, the chain does because the chain, after it makes a new object and no one's referring to that new object anymore, it garbage collects it. But this is storing a bunch of global variables and actually using a lot more memory. So if you do this style, it's harder to read. Your colleagues will not be happy with you. You will not be happy with yourself. You'll be using more memory and it will take more time because when you come back to your code, um, you're, you're going to have a hard time figuring it out. In addition to that, it's buggy. Um, so I'm going to run this here and you can see this uh, red warnings all over the place. Um, this is like the bane of pandas developers everywhere is this error right here. Setting with copy warning. A value is trying to be set on the copy of a slice from a data frame. Try using loc instead. So I mean, I could probably like say how many of you have seen this. If you've used pandas for a little bit, uh, you probably have. And especially if you have some cell like this with 30 operations, then you're like, um, okay, where is that happening, right? And then you start like tacking in copies all over the place with your code and, and trying to fit, just like change things and rerun it to see if it doesn't do that, right? You'll note that my code up here, it, there is no pink splotches of death down here, right? It just worked. Um, so if you chain, not only are you going to be happier, you're not going to have bugs as well. Okay. Um, Anir says, this is me. Now I know better. Awesome. Uh, Edward says, when I get the code, I will do some timing and, and do timing in the notebook. Well, yeah, we'll do some timing here, here below, Edward. Okay. So I'm, uh, red, red, red. Okay. So some people, when, they, when I say like you should do chaining, they're like, no, Matt, you shouldn't. I'm like, why not? Because it's hard to debug. We can't debug it. I'm like, okay, why, why can't you debug it? Because we don't know what the state is. Well, it's actually really easy to debug. Um, I mean, first of all, you can just comment these out. And, and I like to do that. I mean, what I'll do sometimes is just sort of come in here and do something like this, where I'm going to comment uh, this whole thing out. And maybe I won't comment this out, but I'll comment out like, Okay, here we go. Here is the speeds. We just added the speeds column so we can check out this and look at what the speeds column is. There is speeds. Okay, that looks good. Okay, now we're going to do this next one here, which is created on. So you can like comment it out and walk through it and look at what's going on as you're doing it. Okay, now created on looks good, right? So it's actually really easy to debug this way. Um, in addition, there are other ways to debug it as well. I've, I've sort of enumerated them in the comment. Um, you can leverage pipe to uh, capture an intermediate data frame if you want to. So remember, I talked about that pipe command or pipe method. Uh, what you do is you pass in a function and you can pass in arguments to the function. But what it's going to do is it's going to pass the intermediate state of the data frame 
to this function. And all I'm doing here is a, a sort of nasty hack here. I'm saying in the global namespace, make a new variable with the variable names set equal to this current state of the data frame. So this is the state of the data frame after pulling out these columns. So let's run this here. And you'll note that the variable should be named DF3. So, so if I come down here and look at DF3, um, use it, thanks to that pipe, this is that intermediate state. So I can easily do in, inject something like this and pull off inner intermediate state I want to if I want to debug that. In addition, I can do something like this where I can say, uh, let's pipe this. And here I'm using a Lambda function, but basically I'm saying, uh, let's use the IPython display code to display an intermediate one. So this is just going to display it and then it's going to use a short circuit here to also return it. So this keeps the chain alive. And if you look at the output of this, um, the output of this is actually um, uh, two data frames. There's the first one. This first one is actually what we're displaying there. And then the second one is the return value from the call to tweak autos here. So uh, Panda or not Pandas, Jupyter by default only shows the last thing from the cell. Um, but uh, we're explicitly printing out the data frame along the way as well. So th those are various ways to debug this. I claim this is a lot easier than uh, building stuff up and keeping a bunch of random things all over the place. It's just messy. Um, Edward says, why display and not print? I mean, if you want to do print, you can. The thing about display is that display leverages the fact that uh, Jupyter and Pandas have this nice little uh, treaty where if you show a data frame in Jupyter, um, it prints it in this fancy HTML version where you can like get zebra striping and highlight over them. If you do a print, it's going to print the text version of it, which is going to be harder to read. Uh, Kaylee Ann says pipe is interesting. Yeah, uh, it comes in pretty useful as well. Um, okay, Ed Edward says, well, you can display Dunder Ripper if you can. Uh, I mean, yeah, print Dunder Ripper. Okay, I mean, if you want to do that, you can do that. Um, I would say that display is the canonical Jupyter way to do that. But if, you, if you're not in Jupyter, maybe you, you want to dispatch to Dunder Ripper. I mean, typically I try not to call Dunder methods explicitly. And, uh, because there are more implementation details. Okay, uh, so that that is uh, uh, this section here. So let's go into our next section, which is don't mutate. Okay, so another thing I, I hear people say is they're like, Matt, your code looks okay, but like you're wasting a lot of memory. Didn't you know that there's a thing in uh, pandas where you can use in place. And if you use in place, then it doesn't return a new value. It just mutates it in place and you save a bunch of memory. I'm like, okay, yeah, there is that. But um, it turns out that in place is actually a, a dirty lie and it doesn't work. And now I've linked to an issue here. This is from pandas here. And I've also quoted uh, uh, Mr. Reback, one of the pandas core developers from this issue. Uh, the quote says, you're missing the point in place rarely does something in place. You are thinking that you're saving memory, but you're not. You can actually pull up the code for a lot of these methods that have in place on them. What they actually do is they go out and make a new data frame or a new series, and then they shim that in. So you, you're not saving any memory because it's going out and making the other data frame while you do that. So uh, you don't save anything but now you lose the ability to chain because when you call in place, you no longer return the object. So you can't chain anymore. So you're going to write bad code when you use in place. So there aren't performance benefits. You think you're doing something nice. You're not, you're actually going to write worse code. And then you're also going to have to deal with all these setting with copy warning issues that are just annoying. And you'll start reading through all these stack overflows and trying to understand what they mean. And we'll just be confused. Whereas if you just chained in the first place, you wouldn't have to worry about any of that. Okay, um, I, I think I'm done with my mutate rant. Any questions about that? So as you can see, like over the years, um, I'm getting stronger opinions about how to um, uh, code and how people should write code. So again, these are my opinions. You can disagree with them if you want to. Uh, it, this has just been, you know, using pandas since basically it's been out, teaching people pandas, seeing thousands of people learn pandas and use pandas and uh, best practices and things that are confusing along the way. Okay, so, another thing that, yeah, question. Yeah, sorry, Matt. Um, so, so in place of 
in place, what is that you are suggesting? Just um, save it as as the same data frame. Suppose I am dropping nulls, right? DF is equal to DF dot NA in place equals true in place. Instead of doing that, I just do what? Yeah, the question is, what do I do instead? You just don't do it. You just chain, right? And so if I wanted to drop oh. NA here, I would just stick in a drop NA right here. Got you, got you. You're doing the, okay, I got it. Thank you. Yep. 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 So just, uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't say like drop NA and then in, in place is equal. In fact, if you say in place is equal to true right here, um, you, um, because we're returning the result of this, it's going to return none because when you say in place is equal to true, you, didn't, you no longer return the data frame, you return none. Which is another thing that's kind of confusing, uh, just from like a computer science point of view, like theoretically, like if you have an interface and sometimes you return something and sometimes you don't, that actually makes it hard for people to read things and understand why things happen because now you have to keep in your mind like, am I returning something or am I not returning something, right? And it's just another cognitive overhead that if you just don't use in place, you shun it, you, you don't have to worry about that. Okay, other questions? Okay, let's talk about application and you can see, uh, I mean, sort of cutting to the chase right here, don't apply if you can. So uh, we, we've got our data uh, autos two here. Um, now this is very US centric. I mean, it's from the US government, but uh, assume that we want to be more like Eurocentric or the rest of the world. US is miles per gallon. I think the rest of the world is like uh, liters per 100 kilometers, right? So whatever that means, I'm not quite sure, but apparently this is the formula to calculate that, right? So I can say, let's take city 08, which is city mileage for a car, and let's apply this Python function here to convert a value from uh, miles, miles, to ga miles per gallon to liters per 100 kilometers. And if you do this, it looks like it works, right? Awesome. Um, note that this is using the apply. So uh, it turns out that you can also just do this operation right like this. You can say 235 divided by city 08, and this gives you the same results. So these look very similar. However, uh, again, this is one of those devils in the details here because you're calling apply here and you're passing in a python function what this is going to do is it's going to pull out each individual entry from that series convert it to a python object pass the individual entry into this and then uh convert it back into the pandas object so there's a lot of overhead in fact um if we were to time this so i'm going to use percent percent time it which is a jupiter construct here to do some micro benchmarking on this uh Basically, uh, from my computer, depending on when I run this, the time of the day, um, I get usually around a 50%, um, in this case, it's not, it's a little bit less than 50, but I get, I get between like 30 to 50% slower using this apply than using uh, the non-apply version. Because the non-apply version, this right here, again, is leveraging modern CPU architecture, that's SIMD instructions, and can basically say, here's a block of data, do the division on it very quickly. Okay, so here's another example of apply. I'm going to have this little function here. Is this an American car or not, right? Maybe I want to know, you know, are American cars getting worse or better over time? And so let's do make. I'm going to take the make and apply it and uh, see what happens if I do is American. Uh, let's try, instead of using apply here, we're going to use the is in, which is a method that basically is doing what this apply with is, uh, is American is doing. And uh, let's get the timing for that. And you see that this is like, in my case, uh, a little bit less than three times uh, faster here by doing this, right? So generally, especially when you're working with numbers, if you use apply, that's gonna be the slow route. Um, sometimes with strings, apply can be okay. In this case, if you have something like is in, that's gonna be a little bit faster. One thing to note is that a, a strings in pandas aren't super optimized. They're using Python objects under the covers. so. Um, if once you start doing string operations, you're kind of going slow by default, but uh, you can still optimize somewhat here. Um, also note that make here is actually not a string, it's a categorical type here. So I'll actually um, uh, rerun this with, um, with the strings here. 
So converting them to strings and then rerunning it, you'll see that it runs slower converted to strings. Okay, so uh, the, the as type here, um, so the is in instead of doing 1.3 milliseconds is now like 10 times slower. Um, this other one here is also 10 times slower uh, when doing that. So just be aware, uh, converting to categorical can speed that up. Basically what categorical does is it basically makes a mapping of like an integer to the category value. So rather than storing each individual category as its own string, it um, only stores one copy of it. And then when you do an operation, it just has to do that operation on the single value. So especially if you have low cardinality, low number of unique entries, this can be really quick um, versus changing every single entry. Okay, here's one that's a little bit more complicated. I've got like an if else statement. So if country is in this, return US, otherwise return other. So let's, let's try this and we're gonna do a apply here. And then I'm gonna do this version down here, which is gonna say, uh, it's not gonna use apply, but rather it's going to use a sign. And it's, it's a little bit complicated because it's using the where method from pandas. I do like the where method. However, I find that it's a little bit unwieldy. However, I recommend that if you are doing uh, something with apply with numbers, you learn how to do it with the where method because the where method is going to go that fast path, whereas apply is going to go the slow path. You can see that in this case, because this is doing, it, it's operating on strings, um, that using the where is going to be, in this case, it's a little bit slower than doing apply. Um, but if we were not operating on strings, if we were operating on um, numbers, the where would be a lot faster there. Um, here's another option here. We can use NP select. This is something that I wish was in pandas that is not in pandas. Uh, what NP select does is it allows you to uh, specify a list of booleans. And then if those wherever those booleans hold true, uh, you specify a value to put into those places. So it basically lets you kind of make like a switch statement where you say, if this is true, put in this value, if this is true, put in this value, but it's a vectorized version of that. Um, again, because this is on strings, it's not super fast, but uh, if it were on numbers and you had like an if else, you can basically do an if else here. You can do an if else by chaining a bunch of where statements, but it's a little bit hard to read. Um, so in this case, the NP select is, um, is not really shining through here just due to because of it's working with strings. Okay, so that is my apply rant. The takeaway here again is if you're doing numeric processing, avoid apply. If you're using strings, you're sort of already going down the slow route, um, but some operations might be faster using like is in than using apply with strings. Okay, hey, questions about that? What questions do you have? So with this apply or, or assign process, there should not be any use case where we would do a for loop, right? I mean, I come from traditional PL SQL and VB background. So I, I have, I mean, my, my mind is tuned to do a for loop every time I see a data set. But what you are saying is big no for pandas, right? Yeah, question, when should I be using a for loop? Um, yeah. If so, so here's my advice on for loops. If you find yourself using a for loop, your spy descent should go off and you should be thinking, this is a slow path because I'm using a for loop. I'm not being able to take advantage of modern CPU architectures. I'm going through Python rather than this block of memory that's in my data. Is there some way that I can do a for loop without, or, or that I can do this well without using a for loop, right? And a lot of people say, well, I'll use apply and then I don't have to use a for loop. Apply is also a slow route as well. So um, I would recommend trying to where NP select, these are basically the, the tools sets that we have um, for not using for loops. Um, when I actually used a for loop with pandas, um, working on my book the other day. So I've got a, uh, in one, in my book, um, I have a plot. Let's see if I have it in my old book. I think I have it in my old book. Let me pull it up. I, mean, I can put it on my face, my camera, I think here. I have a plot in here where I annotate the plot. 
Uh, never mind, I don't have it here. It's not in this book. Um, okay, I'm not. I'm not going to pull up because I just rebooted my machine. I, it was on. It was on a browser, but it wasn't there. But basically, I annotated the plot. I had some line plot, and then I had, and so I plotted a line that had like elevation for an ultra running marathon, and then um, at each point. Um, where I had that elevation was actually a like way station, a checkpoint along the way of the race. And I had another column, which was a string column. And I pulled out that string column and stuck it in the plot. So you could see uh, on the plot where that point was, right? And so to annotate that using matplotlib, I actually used a for loop to say for each value in the series, um, actually, actually iterated over the whole data frame. Um, so I said, for I did an iter rows to iterate over the rows because that would give me the X and Y location because the X location was like mileage and the Y location was elevation. So I used the X and Y from the row and also the label from the row and then used matplotlib to plot those out. And I did a for loop and did each of those plots along the way. So I think, you know, if you're doing something like that, it's okay. But it, it, you know, it, it, if you're like tempted to like use a for loop in pandas, generally you should think twice about that. Does that answer your question? It does, it does. Thanks, man. Other questions? Okay. Um, my last point here is just to master aggregation. And, I, and it's not really a rant per se, but just um, uh, generally aggregation is something that your boss wants you to report on, right? If you're going, say, say I work at a candy store, I'm a cashier at a candy store, and the boss comes in and says, how are we doing today? The boss really, unless they're like really bored, doesn't really want to know that Sally came in about a Tootsie Roll and a lollipop and a candy bar. And then Billy came in about two candy bars and a Tootsie Roll and a stick of gum. And then Cindy came in and bought one candy bar and two Tootsie Rolls. Your boss doesn't care about the details. What they want is an aggregation. They want you to say, we had 28 people come in today. The average purchase order size was $5.32. We sold 628 pieces of candy, right? We're gonna collapse that information or we're gonna aggregate it. Those are the sorts of things that most people want to be reported on. They, a lot of people don't care about the details. Now, again, I did say work with the raw data because inevitably someone's gonna ask you about the details. So you do want to be able to go back to the details and, and that's sort of like usually a, a one-off type of thing, but generally people are going to ask you about aggregations and pandas has uh, great ways to do this with this group by there's also a pivoting in there as well. But uh, let's just look at this. And again, I'm going to write this in this chain style. I could write this in one line of code. However, I'm going to take in this case, four lines of code because it's going to make it easier to read. It's also easier to debug, right? Cause I can come in here and I can say, okay, we're going to start off with autos. Then I'm going to do group by, this is going to be lazy. It's going to return me this group by object. And then I'm going to take the mean of this. Okay, so you can see that my index now is the year. I'm grouping by the year. And um, then for, new, for every numeric column, I have the mean for each year. So this is pretty powerful. I mean, literally, this is one line of code. I've written it as four, but you can do these sorts of aggregations very quickly. Um, so one thing to watch out for is if you're uh, limiting what your aggregation, you, you might want to watch the order of this. So let's run this one here. So here I'm gonna say, let's do a group by year. I'm gonna pull out the combined and speed column, and then I'm gonna take the mean of that. Um, so there's our aggregation right there. Now, if instead of um, taking the, the mean after pulling out the columns, we did the mean before, uh, the second one here, I'm gonna do a time it here. Uh, the second one here is going to calculate the mean of all the numeric columns. So you're going to pay a little bit of a penalty for that. Um, so this is like almost three times slower because it's calculating the mean of all the columns. So you, you, you can do something smart here in this case when you're aggregating say, I, I know I only want to look at these columns. So pull those two columns off before I do my aggregation. Okay, we're gonna do some plots here. So I'm just gonna load some, some uh, code to make my plots a little bit prettier. Okay, so once I've got these, um, so again, he, he, here, whoops. So I, I do like this because I can step through this, right? So I'm gonna take autos, I'm gonna group by year. It's gonna be lazy, it doesn't do anything until I tell it what to do. I'm gonna plot these columns, it's still lazy because I haven't aggregated. Now I'm gonna plot the mean and now I'm gonna do a plot of this. 
So uh, one thing, to, if you can master group by and plotting, you can make these plots very easily. One of the key things to know about plotting in pandas is a normal plot is a line plot. And what it's going to plot is the index along the x-axis and each column as a line. So I just uncommented that plot there. Let's plot this here. And you can see along the x is the, in, x is the index. And each of these uh, lines here is a column. So if you can remember that, it makes it makes it really easy to do plots here. So uh, per year, this is the number of speeds. It looks like the average number of speeds is going up in our cars per year. And it looks like our mileage, combined mileage is going up. It looks like maybe it plateaued in the last couple of years or so. But over time, uh, with this data set at least, the combined mileage has gone up as has the number of speeds. Okay, and, and because I've written in th this way, where I, I basically have a recipe, if instead of doing the median here, I want to do the quantile, I can just comment out median and say, let's do quantile here. So I'll comment out plot, here's the quantile, right? Um, but if I do the quantile, here's the 10th the percent quantile. So quantile, if you're not familiar with it, it's like we order everything and then we go 10% in and whatever the 10% value is, that's what we're plotting here. So this is a 10% quantile. If I want like the 99th percent quantile, um, I can do that. So this is like what everyone's kid is. Everyone's kid is in the 99th percentile. So you can figure that out really quickly. But this makes it really easy to just try things out, right? Um, I can just comment this out. If, if instead of quantile, maybe I want like standard deviation, I can say STD here, and here's the standard deviation. Or if I wanted the variance, I could do the variance here. So really easy to just try different things out. And, and uh, if you're using this chain style, uh, uh, explore with that. Okay, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to add country. So I'm going to, so let me just walk through this, this code here. Whoops. I'm going to say, okay, here's my autos. Okay. And I'm going to add uh, the country column. So assign is going to add a country. And uh, so if I scroll over here at the end, I should see country at the end popped on here. We can just check that there is country at the end. Okay, other and US. Now I'm gonna group by, now watch this. Instead of grouping by a single column, I'm gonna group by two columns, year and country. Okay, this is gonna be lazy, it's not gonna do anything. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the mean of this. So I should have in the index two entries and then I'm gonna have the mean of every numeric column. There we go. Uh, now this is what's called a hierarchical index. Uh, this thing in the bold on the left, there are two entries. There's the year and the country in that. And then we have every column here, we have the calculate the mean value for every column. So this is actually pretty powerful. If you squint at this, you're familiar with um, pivot tables in Excel. This is pretty much starting to get you like a pivot table would in Excel. Okay, and, and I can group by arbitrary number of things. So if I have some sort of hierarchy that I wanna group by, I can do that as well. Um, here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to assign my country column. I'm going to group by year and country, but look what I'm going to do. Instead of doing just a si single aggregation, I'm going to call the ag method and I'm going to pass in a list of aggregations. So I'm going to take the minimum value for each year in each country. I'm going to take the mean value and I'm going to pass in this function here, um, which is the second to last. So this is an aggregating function. Remember aggregations take a sequence and collapse it. So I can define any function that I want here. I'm going to take a series and I'm going to return the second to last item from it. Sort of silly, but just demonstrating that this is a, an aggregating function that reduces those values here. So let's run this. And here we go. Here's the result of that. We get in our index, we have a hierarchical, hierarchical index, but we also have hierarchical column labels here. So for every numeric column, I have the min value, the mean value, and the second to last value. So again, you can squint at this and this is basically gives you the ability to replicate what you do in Excel, um, but programmatically from Python. So it's kind of cool. Um, so generally, it uh, turns out that working with these hierarchical, especially hierarchical columns tends to be a pain in pandas. So I try and avoid that where possible, but um, I'm gonna go back to a simpler one here. I'm just gonna go back to uh, grouping by year and country and then um, taking the mean, and then we're going to do a plot of this. So what this is going to do is it's going to plot the index and the x-axis. You can see that the index is hierarchical, so this might be messed up a little bit, and uh, indeed it is. We're plotting a tuple here in the x-axis, which gives us sort of a weird plot. So what we might want to do, watch this. Um, so here, here's where we were at before. 
Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do this unstack operation. This is one of those things that's a little bit brain bending, but basically what we're doing is we're going to take the innermost index, which is country, and we're going to rotate it. We're going to unstack it. And we're going to stick it in the, in the, into uh, the columns. So now we just have year here, and now we took the country and we made hierarchical columns from that. Okay, so this, this is actually pretty powerful because then I can do something like this. Let me just maybe walk through this. I'll comment these out um, and you can walk through it. You can hopefully you can start understanding why I like this chain style here because it makes doing this and understanding what's going on very easily. So here's our aggregation here. I'm going to unstack it. That's going to stick country up into the columns. Okay, countries in the columns. Now I'm going to pull off city 08. So I'm going to pull off this column, which will give me these two uh, columns down here. This is actually going to give me a data frame that's not hierarchical. Okay, so now I have uh, for US and other countries, I have the city 08 my average mileage. Now I'm going to plot that. And this is a comparison from US versus other countries for our uh, mileage. Okay, and the uh, map plot is putting the legend in the middle there. So I'm just going to stick in this code to stick the legend on the side. Okay, so th this is like literally one line of code. I've written it as like eight lines of code, right? But if you wanted to say, instead of the mean here, we want to do like whatever, the standard deviation, you can, you can stick in whatever you want in here. You can try these different things and, and uh, play with that very easily because we are using this style of coding here. Um, so here, uh, this might look like a little jagged, so I can, I can further manipulate it here. Maybe I'll just comment this out and, and show you a little bit more manipulation here. So here's what I had here, city. Um, if I wanna smooth this out, one thing, one hack to do that is like do a rolling average. I'm gonna say rolling two and take the mean of, of that. And so now if I plot this, this should be a little bit more smoothed out. And you can see that compared to this one versus this one, it's a little bit more smoothed out here. So uh, just leveraging different pandas tools. Okay, uh, questions about aggregation and grouping. Um, I have a question. Yeah. So there is one type of group I often do is actually doing in SQL. I haven't found out like what's the best way to do it in pandas. So essentially oftentimes uh, in SQL, you can do a group by sort of column then you want to actually immediately filter results. So you use group by column A, column B, because they're having, having some kind of condition right there. So for me, it's always like, I have to put the group by results. I usually, you know, for now I see the chaining one, but because the group by results sometimes can be very tricky because you don't even know how they name the column. Because somehow depending on what you do, the column name becomes a little bit weird. Sometimes it's a hierarchy, you often have to save out the group by results into a data frame, like an intermediate variable. Then I see the results of the data frame, and then I do a filter. So essentially I'm using the brackets to put all my where, it's like a sequence corresponding having clause into those uh, intermediate uh, group by results to do the filtering. I just wondering, you know, whether you have maybe a better way uh, to do this type of uh, manipulation of data. So you, you want to do a filter by, you want to simulate a having from a SQL query. Yeah, so for example, just as today, like one thing I need to do is I basically load up a whole bunch of data in the data frame. Uh, those are, there's a particular column, it's basically ID, but there are some of those ones actually, the ID is supposed to be a primary key, but it'll have duplicates in it. And I want to check it. In SQL, that's very simple. I just say group by primary key, then having count one greater than one. Then that gives me all the duplicate primary key if it's a SQL table. So just wondering, you know, in this case, I actually did a group by, I did a count, saved the results out, then filtered out where the count is actually greater than one. I just wonder, you know, what would be a, maybe a better way? Like in your chaining, how would you chain this thing together? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um... I feel like I'm in an interview situation now. Um, I am, I'm, I'm trying to like think of like an example that I can take my current, my current uh, data frame and, and like manipulate it to, to something similar to what you're asking. I mean, group by year and country and then say like where we have counts greater than 50 or something like that. And then you would want to filter that. Yeah, um, something like that. Yeah, so I mean, let's, just play for the, with that for a minute. I, I'm going to say count here. 
okay? And so here are for each uh, year in each country. And so maybe I want where the count is greater than, um, so I can say whatever, GT. So this, this is the whole data frame, but we'll say like where it's greater than, uh, let's say 700. Okay, so what this gives me is uh, this, um, this gives me a data frame that's a Boolean data frame. And then I can use this to filter this if I wanted to. Um, now at this point, um, I would probably use a pipe to do this, right? And so I would probably do something like this, where I'd say pipe, um, vowels, GT, and then maybe I'd pass in a 700 here. And then I'd come up here and I'd define a function called vowels GT. And this is gonna take a data frame here and it's also gonna take uh, some number. And then I'm gonna say, okay, um, I've got my data frame and I'm gonna say, I want to return the data frame where the data frame uh, dot GT is greater than number. Okay, and so if you look at this, um, this has maybe what you want. Maybe you want to drop an A's on this after. So that's probably how I'd do it, thinking off the top of my head, but there might be a better way to do it. Yeah, I think that there's a comment from Travis about the dot filter method of the group by results help. After looking to it, yeah, uh -huh. maybe that's something. Okay. Yeah, that's basically that's what it is. I was trying to say, as you said, if you just do a strict greater than, you get basically a Boolean mask. So uh -huh. You kind of have to put this Boolean mask into, onto you, your group by results. That's, that's what I'm yeah. saying. I end yeah, up so having to save the intermediate results from group by, then basically yeah. apply this mask on yeah. top of like a two-step process. Yeah, H hence my recommendation to use pipe Right, so th this what I've highlighted here is the Boolean mask. Um, and so using pipe, you can sort of like make a different variable if you need to for a while, use that to do filtering and then go back into your chain if you need to. I mean, one of the nice things about this is because I have this function here, I can say, oh, let's group by anything that's over 900, right? And so 1991 should go away here. So. Okay, all right, great. Thank you for pointing about that pipe. I, I wasn't aware of that, you know, before you talk. That's yeah. something definitely learned from your talk. Yeah, awesome. Uh, Travis says, could you do a filter from the group by? Um, yeah, you could probably do that as well. I mean, off the top of my head, I'm, I'm, um, I and mean, we could play around with it, but that, like I said, there might be other other ways to do that as well. And so I'll say this, like pandas, pandas often has more than one, more than two, more than three, more than four ways to do something, right? And so that, that makes it often uh, can be confusing or overwhelming, right? But it, it sort of puts us in a place similar to Perl where uh, you can write pandas code that uh, you know makes sense to you, but then when you start sharing or collaborating with others, it makes it harder. So again, my my point that I do like to uh, standardize some things and uh, and and focus on making things that are easy to read. And so yeah, it, th there could be some way that's cleaner than this using filter. Um, yeah, I, off the top of my head, I don't don't know right now. Other questions? Matt, would you be able to share the notebook or is it proprietary? Yeah, question, can I share the notebook? Yeah, there's nothing proprietary about it. It's just not in a public place. So if you just want to email me um, or you can DM me on Twitter, uh, Dunder M. Harrison, or I, I think I put my email in the chat here. Um, but no, I, I'll do it on Twitter. I, I follow you on Twitter, so I'll do it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just DM me and uh, yeah, there's no, there's nothing proprietary in this. In fact, I mean, I want people to leverage this, uh, this style because personally I do believe 
that you will be happier, your code will be happier, your boss will be happier, your customers will be happier, your colleagues will be happier if, if you uh, adopt some of these things I've talked about today. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll summarize this. Um, so summary, um, if you use the correct types, you're gonna save memory. One thing to be aware of is that Pandas is an in-memory tool. So for better, for worse, you have to be able to fit it into memory. Now we live in a day where you can go out and rent a machine that has a huge amount of memory, right? So I, I mean, I know clients who were like, instead of firing up some DAS cluster or Spark, they'll just fire up a big server on um, Amazon and do their processing there using pandas, right? But if you use the right types, you can get away with a smaller server, right? We saw that, I mean, I also, I had like a 60% savings by using the correct types and I could probably even optimize that further. Um, also by using the correct types, you, uh, you know, if you've got something that was converted to a string, but should be numeric, that's going to be problematic because you can't do math operations on a string. Um, and then if, if you convert things to dates, you get uh, this nice little DT accessor that allows you to do a lot of nice handy date manipulations that you could do with a string, but there would be huge pain. And so why would you want to inflict that pain? Um, again, chaining, my take is that if, if there's one thing that I would say take away from this, it's start chaining your code, figure out how to chain it. In fact, um, I would say my my biggest contribution to this book was basically I rewrote everything as chains. I did add some chapters like on testing and pandas and I, there's not a lot of code available hardly anywhere like doing things like testing or debugging pandas. So um, I think that's pretty nice from the book. But uh, if you chain, your code will be easier to read. You will remove bugs. It'll be easier to debug. So I highly recommend it. Uh, don't mutate. There's no point in mutating. Um, just don't do it. Uh, generally apply is slow for math operations. So if, if you find yourself using apply or even worse using a for loop, uh, consider whether you really need to do that or if there's another way to do that. And then aggregations are powerful. They can be confusing, right? Uh, I mean, a lot of pandas is, is, is really confusing. I teach a lot of people who are like Python developers and they come to pandas they're like, what is going on here? This doesn't even look like Python code, right? So, so it can be confusing. It takes time. My, my thing is like, Take a deep breath, relax. Um, uh, the more you practice it and play around with it, the easier it's gonna get. Uh, so uh, same with aggregations. Uh, write them in this chain style, start playing around with them, step through what's going on so you can see what's going on. Uh, if you like this uh, and you want more content like this, I mean, I, I do tweet stuff like this on Twitter. Um, and again, like I said, I am going to be running a, an idiomatic pandas workshop. Uh, the point of that workshop is you come in with your buggy pandas code or your pandas code that looks like uh, the code that I said you shouldn't write. And then we spend a couple days basically in groups, uh, basically rewriting your code and making it fast and easy to read. And you walk away from that with uh, a big smile on your face and your boss will be happy. Okay. Uh, thanks everyone. It's been a pleasure. Uh, being able to rant to you for the past hour or so. Um, happy to field any more questions if there are, but I, I guess I'll uh, pass the mic back over to our host unless there are questions. Thank you so very much, uh, Matt, for that talk. I learned more. <laughs> I, I will start focusing more on chaining than I currently do, so. Uh, even though I did read that in your book and I read it, <laughs> I did not put it into practice and I will um, from here on out. Um, I guess a couple things that I just want to say uh, is that we, the speaker series will be continuing um, for the next six months. We have talks lined up. Uh, stay posted on the PyData SLC uh, website. Um, uh, you can follow up with Matt if you want to get uh, access to his um, uh, to his to his Jupiter notebook. Mm -hmm.